We'll start again. Thank you so much all for coming to, to uh, today's Wednesday seminar. And it's a special, special one today, uh, being a, a distinguished GA lecturer series, uh, but also with some special guests uh, as well, who I'll introduce shortly. Uh, I'm Trent Kershaw. I'll be your, uh, your chair for today. Uh, and I'll, I'll just start by, uh, by acknowledging the traditional owners and, and custodians uh, of uh, uh, country throughout Australia. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, their continuing uh, connection to land, waters and community. Uh, and I'd like on behalf of Geoscience Australia to pay uh, our respects to the people, the cultures and the elders, uh, past and present. So today's seminar uh, consists of two complementary talks uh, that focus on the great work uh, uh, being done uh, by the Digital Earth Africa uh, program. Uh, the first of these will be uh, uh, Dr. Lisa Maria Rebello, uh, who is Digital Earth Africa's lead scientist and a principal researcher at the International Water Management Institute. Uh, Dr. Rebello is a remote sensing specialist with over 20 years of experience in Africa uh, and Asia, and her talk, uh, Earth Observations for Water Resources Management, is also uh, the Crawford Fund Derek Tribe Address for 2022. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome uh, the CEO of uh, the Crawford Fund, Dr. Colin Chartres, uh, to introduce her. So please join me, and, and for those in the room, nice and loud, thank you. Uh, please join me in welcoming Colin to the stage. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, today's a bit a day of reminiscence for me because uh, I used to work in this building as chief of land, water and geohazards um, for a short period when it was brand new and it's nice to see it's still going uh, strong. And it's also uh, similarly reminiscent in that I was Director General of IMI where Lisa uh, currently works uh, between 2007 and 2012. Now I haven't got much time so um, before I introduce uh, Lisa's talk I want to uh, present her with the uh, Derek Tribe Award. I'll just say a few brief words about uh, the Crawford Fund and the Derek Tribe Award. The Crawford Fund's main role is to promote the, uh, the benefits of international agricultural research broadly in the Australian community and to do a wide range of training and courses for emerging scientists, agricultural scientists in Australia uh, and overseas. And by, in, in terms of agriculture, we cover the whole gamut of uh, areas starting from agronomy, uh, veterinary science, uh, forestry, fisheries, land and water and environment. Uh, so we have a fairly broad remit. Uh, we depend very much on uh, volunteers, uh, often uh, retirees who've had significant careers in agriculture. So we have a very extensive network across the country and reaching out overseas. Derek Tribe, was the, uh, the founder of the Crawford Fund. Uh, we're 35 years old this year. Uh, Derek realised it would be important uh, to have a fund such as the Crawford Fund, which supports young Australian and international agricultural scientists. And with the support of the Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering, he was able to establish uh, that, that fund. We're currently supported by ACR, the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, and by state governments and a few private donations. Moving to, uh, to Lisa. Um, Lisa Marie Rebello is the lead scientist in, for Digital Earth Africa and principal researcher, Earth Observations for Sustainable Development in the International Water Management Institute based in Colombo, Sri Lanka. Lisa has been uh, awarded the Derek Tribe Award for 2022 by the Crawford Fund. She has been recognised for her work across the African continent and in South and Southeast Asia in water productivity, remote sensing, natural resource management, wetland monitoring and, ass and assessment, basin water accounting and water productivity. A very wide gamut of uh, areas, but all sort of uh, underpinned by remote, remote sensing. The uh, Crawford Fund Derek Tribe Award was inaugurated in 2001 to mark the outstanding contributions of Emeritus Professor Derek Tribe, Foundation Director of the Fund, to the promotion of international agricultural research. 
The award itself is made biannually to a citizen of a developing country in recognition of their distinguished contributions to the application of research in agriculture or natural resource management in developing countries or countries. So Lisa Marie, uh, Maria joins a, a very significant group of past awardees. So with that, uh, Lisa Marie, I'd like you to come up and uh, accept the award. Which is in the uh, form of a, a medal, so I don't know which. <laughs> I'll give you the medal first. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, there's the case. <laughs> <laughs> and that's an additional copy. Um, so with that, I'll just uh, largely leave it to Lisa Maria to introduce herself. But her title is Earth Observations for Water Resources Management. Thank you. Thank you, Colin, and good morning, everyone, um, those in the room and those joining us online. I'm going to start with a bit of a context for my research, and then I'm going to move into three examples. Climate change is already being experienced by communities around the world through increasing variability and greater water stress. Yet our understanding of water, its availability, its use, is a long way from what is needed in order to support communities to adapt. Water accounting is an essential tool for better understanding where water is used, by whom, and how water productivity, water savings can be enhanced. This information is essential for su successful planning of adaptation actions. But with climate change, we know that the past is a less and less reliable guide, and policy planning investment, as well as local management action, will depend more and more on data and information on how much water is available, where it is, how it's being used, and similarly, the nature of food and energy production and demand, and on how these are changing. So over the next 20 to 30 minutes, I'll talk through how Earth observation data can be used to co-design solutions to these challenges using examples from the, across the African continent. So African countries contribute to only a small proportion, two to 3% of global emissions, but will disproportionately feel the impact. That's what's demonstrated in this graphic. So across the top and in pink, on the map, we have the CO2 emitting nations with the size of the circles representing metric tons of CO2. Across the bottom and on the map in blue are the vulnerable nations. The stark contrast between Africa and other continents is clear. High water stress is estimated to affect about 250 million people in the continent currently and is expected to displace up to 700 million by 2030. Four out of five African countries are unlikely to have sustainably managed water resources by 2030. But the African continent includes 54 countries, multiple climatic zones, massive rainforests, huge deserts, and a myriad of water resources challenges. But despite the contrasts, there are a few broadly shared water resources challenges which need better data. So these are shown on the image on the slide. Scarcity in sufficient water to meet growing needs, variability, natural variability, which is being exacerbated by a changing climate, quality, increasing levels of pollution, and productivity. How can we produce more from the water that is available? And so my research focus has been on a few underlying challenges that are critical to socioeconomic development and resilience, are widespread, have significant data gaps, and would benefit from regional or larger scale approaches. So noting that while the examples that I'm gonna go through are based on Afri the African context and specific African countries, the tools are also applicable elsewhere. So globally, around 80% of water extracted is used in agriculture, while 30% of the world's available energy supports agricultural production. 
while producing also 35% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. And yet, we need to produce more food. On present trends, the African continent will only produce 13% of the food, its food needs by 2050. African agriculture has huge potential. Only around 5% of cultivated land in Africa is irrigated, compared to 41% in Asia. The average African farm performs at only about 40% of its potential. Irrigation alone could increase output by up to 50%. But can this be done on existing agricultural land, using clean energy? And is there sufficient water now and under future climate scenarios? Well, this is what I'm going to have a look at in the next example. So the first example I'm going to look at takes us to Mali, a country in West Africa. Nearly 80% of Mali's population is dependent on agriculture, and most of these are smallholders who own less than 10 hectares of land and practice subsistence farming. The case study focuses on the Sugu district in Mali, where 90% of agriculture is under rain-fed conditions. The quantity of grain produced by these smallholders is insufficient to meet their dietary requirements, resulting in food insecurity and malnourishment. Small-scale farmer-led irrigation practices are cost-effective and scalable agricultural water management solutions that have been shown to improve food security and livelihoods of smallholders in sub-Saharan Africa. So through a USAID-funded Innovation Lab for Small-Scale Irrigation, uh, projects, the International Water Management Institute has developed an earth observation based tool to assess the suitability of solar irrigation for smallholder farmers. And the outputs from this have shown that the Sugu district is some of the largest areas suitable for solar powered ir irrigation in Mali. But while this technology might consume a small amount of water, collectively it can add up to significant water withdrawals. So the hydrological setting for Tsugu. It's located in the upper Niger River Basin. The Niger River and its tributaries are the main source of water. The basin is primarily located within Mali, but it's a transboundary river basin. It's also shared with Guinea, Cote d'Ivoire, and Burkina Faso. It experiences highly variable rainfall, which results in seasonal flows, which are extremely low during the dry season. Ultimately, the water flows into the inner Niger Delta, which is the largest wetland in the continent and the third largest mangrove forest in the world. So environmental flows are key. The sustainability of African agriculture, of Afri sorry, the sustainability of agricultural expansion strategies depends on water resources being available for use in both the wet and the dry seasons, after accounting for all existing demands, and in this case, as I mentioned, environmental flows are particularly significant. It's a data scarce basin. Water resources are not reported on a regular basis. So due to the lack of the in situ monitoring networks in the basin, we've used an earth observation based water accounting framework to quantify water resource use and availability and to identify opportunities to upscale the adoption of small scale irrigation practices using solar powered irrigation sustainably and to support agricultural resilience in Mali. So the framework developed by IMI and its partners is designed for data scarce environment, environments and relies on satellite data as input, hydrological models and global data sets to calculate consistent water accounts across time and space to avoid data discrepancies between adjacent regions or across national uh, borders in the case of transboundary river basins and to provide estimates where local data are insufficient. In situ data, I will note, are still needed for calibration, validation, and bias correction of the satellite data. So we implement it in three main steps, um, as you see on the slide. Almost 20 different input data sets related to the land surface, the water cycle, some are dynamic from daily to monthly, some are static. In the second step, these are input into a pixel-based modeling framework to calculate the water balance. Now the water balance describes the flow of water into and out of a system. Such as, a, such as a river basin, and it can be used to help manage water supply and predict where there may be water shortages. The next stage is to take those outputs to calculate further indicators and to present them through a water account. 
So the water accounts establish the baseline of water resource availability and use. They track changes in water flows and storage in a region over, over time. And water accounts can be used to identify whether water is available for further allocation and to identify the sustainability of interventions at the basin scale. So what does it look like? Well, there's a whole load of information in there, different indicators, uh, volumes of water, but essentially what the water account does is it helps a user to understand how much water is flowing into the system, how much water is lost or consumed through evapotranspiration, so it's not available for further use within that system, how much water is available to be exploited, of that, how much is already being used, and how much is reserved or should be reserved for downstream countries, any legal sharing agreements, and environmental flows. And then what this allows us to do is to understand how much water is still available for further allocation and use. So back to uh, this, the, the, uh, Niger data, uh, the Niger Basin example. So what we see from the water accounts is a hydrological seesaw. Most of the annual rainfall, up to 88%, in the basin is received during the wet season. So there's a positive water balance. There's a water surplus conditions during this time. During the dry season, however, the basin receives a small proportion of the annual precipitation. And due to the weather conditions, there's high evapotranspiration. So a lot of the water um, is consumed. In fact, almost all of the rainfall is consumed through evapotranspiration, um, which is received in the dry season, as well as any remaining surplus from the wet season. So putting this in the context of the potential for smallholder irrigation using solar technologies. The solar assessments have shown, uh, have given us a figure for the total identified area which would be suitable in the Sugu district. But these results, when we combine it uh, with the water accounts, show that surface water is unavailable during, is, is available only during the wet season. So the surface water yield from the wet season could support a crop in about 20% of the areas in the Sugu district, but this would, however, require interventions such as check dams, ponds, other structures that can store wet season water surpluses. Any further irrigation during the dry season must be groundwater dependent. So we went one step further with the modeling to look at the groundwater availability. And this demonstrated that considering the maximum groundwater recharge and sustainable yield estimates, groundwater resources could support the irrigation water demand of crops covering an area of only about 80,000 hectares in the district. So what this demonstrates is the potential application of earth observation, the importance of a nexus approach. And while there's potential to expand smallholder irrigation, this needs to be done within the sustainable limits to water resource use as identified. So the second example, we'll move to Morocco, which is a country in North Africa, to look at the water and security nexus in a much smaller river basin, the Sousmassa. So this work was funded uh, by FCDO through the Center for Mediterranean Integration and implemented with the Abia Abayash, the Basin Authority uh, in Sousmassa. So droughts in Morocco have been increasing in frequency over the last few decades, leading to volatile economic growth rates in the country. In Sousmassa, as well as in other uh, basins in the region, a severe multi-year drought is ongoing and reservoir levels are low. At the request of the Abayash, we use the same water accounting approach to quantify the water balance and assess water use and availability to firstly improve understanding of the water resources and the challenges and opportunities to address increasing levels of water, water scarcity, but also in this case to assess the potential implications of climate change on future water resources within the basin. So what you hear, see here on the slide in the image is the water balance summarized for the mean annual uh, situation over the te past 10 years. That's on the left and on the right, uh, the mean dry season uh, water balance. So there are three, uh, three key points, three arrows. You'll see coming into the basin, the top, a blue arrow. Now this is the amount of rainfall that the basin receives. So on the left, that's the mean annual value over the 10 years. And on the right, that's the average for, the, for a dry season. 
The next arrow across is an orange arrow, which shows the total water consumed over that period. So in the case of uh, the annual, looking at the annual water balance, 80% of the rainfall received is consumed, so not available for further use. Looking at the mean dry season uh, situation, it's 186%. So 186% of the rainfall received by the basin is used. So, sorry, 100% of the rainfall is used plus rain, uh, water from other sources. And then the third arrow is the water that leaves the basin. So that's the outflow in the bottom left. So over 95% of the wet season available water is consumed through managed processes. This is irrigation, greenhouses, reservoirs. And even though there is more water available during the wet season compared to the dry season, there is typically not enough to satisfy the demand since large proportions of the water is too polluted to use. So that quantity that is leaving the basin in the outflow cannot be used because of the levels of pollution. So on average, an additional three kilometers cubed of water, so that's the figure you'll see marked as storage change in the middle of the map, is needed. This is extracted from groundwater in order to meet this demand. So the key messages associated with this example that very little water is available for allocation and the current levels of abstraction are not sustainable. The study confirms that overall the demand for water exceeds the sustainable supply with a deficit provided by groundwater. When water is consistently taken out of storage in this way on, on, on an annual basis to meet demand, the water balance is not sustainable. And steps need to be taken to manage the deficits to avoid undesirable consequences. Water quality is exacerbating the water scarcity. So given that there is scarcity of water in the basin, improving water quality could increase water availability and contribute towards a more sustainable water balance. Land degradation also needs to be addressed. Approximately one third of the water consumed in the basin is from bare or degraded land, so it's not being used productively. More than half of the surface area of the basin, about 60%, is actually bare land. So looking to the right is the summary of the future conditions and they show that water scarcity will continue to increase in the future. Assessment of the water balance under future climate scenarios indicates that with the climate extremes predicted, water scarcity will increase during the 2030s and 2050s time horizons and issues around water quality will become even more critical. A projected decrease in precipitation is likely to, li likely to result in the basin becoming even more water limited and con consequently more arid. So the water security challenge for the Seuss Massa Basin is there's a critical need to balance water resource allocation and to improve water scarcity. And several investments have been made to improve uh, water security and to address this at the moment. So there are two new large dams and several small and medium dams in process, along with an interbasin transfer to Agadir for domestic purposes and completion of a major seawater desalination plant. Will these efforts meet the needed demand that we see from the water accounts? Well, unfortunately not. The water accounts show that only a fraction, 22% of the projected 2030 demand will be met, including um, taking into account these, these uh, planned interventions. So given increasing demand across all sectors and changing climate conditions, regular and consistent monitoring is critical to the sustainable management of resources in the basin. So the Climate Vulnerability Monitor, which is what you see uh, on the slide now, assesses the impact of climate change. And the chart looks at four different areas of climate impact, health, weather, habitat, and agriculture, which are represented by an icon of a heart, a hurricane, trees, uh, and a grain silo. And the impacts are divided into the present day on one side and a projection for 2030. And what you see is that almost no region in Africa won't be severely affected. And I've included Australasia at the bottom as a point of comparison. So the situation is similar across North Africa to that of what we see in the Sousse Massa in Morocco, 
with large impacts on food security and land degradation, which in turn will exacerbate water scarcity. So there's a critical need to use the available water better. And the last case study I'm going, case study I'm going to look at investigates how we can use earth observations to identify ways to use water in agriculture more productively. So for this last example, we move across the continent to East Africa and to Ethiopia. The example focuses on the Koga uh, irrigation scheme, which is in the north of Ethiopia. And I look at an initiative which is funded by the Dutch Foreign Ministry and the UN Food and Agricultural Organization. So Koga is an irrigation scheme for smallholder farmers. It was uh, established in 2010, late 2009. It has 12 irrigation blocks targeting 7,000 7, hectares currently irrigated, targeting 10,000 beneficiaries. And the water, there's no, the water uh, there, there's no charge for the water, and the farmers have little control over the timing of when the water is available. So the water, uh, water user associations have esta been established to improve water allocation and rotation. During the irrigation season, we see excess supply of water combined with untimely irrigation. We also see a lack of knowledge uh, of how much to irrigate and when, resulting in low yields, low water productivity. So water productivity describes how much production we get per unit of water used. And this results in conflicts uh, between irrigators and across the scheme. So the FAO has developed a publicly accessible near real-time database using satellite data that allows for the monitoring of agricultural water productivity at different scales, focusing on the African continent. The initiative has three components, which is what you see in the schematic. My team and I have worked for several years in addressing the third component of this, which is translating the data into usable and action actionable information by co-designing applications with end users. So there's an abundance of tools available which are range from ICT-based to field-based to guide irrigation scheduling with farmers. But these tools are largely driven by the scientific community. A few tools provide easy information for farmers and as a result, adoption remains low. We also see that efficient use on farm of water does not necessarily translate in more efficient use of water at user group or scheme level. So while you can make savings at a farm level, it doesn't translate to to, to broader scale savings. So what we did for, for this particular example, looking at the case of the Koga irrigation scheme, we've taken the satellite based outputs to identify uh, and target opportunities for improving water use for agricultural production. So what you see on the left uh, is a video which moves through the irrigation seasons from 2009 when the scheme was established to 2019, so a 10-year period. And what it shows is the water, how the water is used. So it goes from low water use in yellow to high water use in blue. And you can see as the scheme developed, the water use increased across the scheme. But you can also see that there are spatial variations with higher water use in the head end of the scheme near the reservoir and lower, um, a lower water use towards the tail end in the north. On the right, the data are shown on an annual basis. So you can see clearly the increase in water consumption, the water that's being used across the entire scheme over the 10 years. So we go one step further to look at how that water is being consumed. So whether it is being evaporated from bare soil or whether it's being used by the plant and transpired and thus used beneficially. So again, we go across 10 years here, uh, looking at the irrigation season, and you can see that the water is being used more beneficially as we move through the years. So you have a move from low beneficial use in red to higher beneficial use in blue. But you'll still see across all years that the water is used more beneficially towards the reservoir than it is further away. So what did we do? Well, we took this data after conducting the diagnostics and, and targeting and combined it with block level um, water delivery information to derive further performance statistics related to adequacy, equity and reliability. Based on the diagnostics and the capacity needs assessment conducted with the farmers, we, we selected two devices 
uh, through which are actually supported through the Virtual Irrigation Academy. One is a simple mechanic device, mechanical device, and one is a more complex one to build farmer understanding of soil moisture around the timing and quantity of irrigation needed by the plant. So we worked with a thousand farmers split into three, three groups, one which used one tool, one which used a different, the, the second tool, and one which was a control group. And looking at, um, at the outputs of that study, well, the green dots show where the field sensors were located. The orange dots are the control group without interventions. The tools were in place for two irrigation seasons, and the yellow blocks, the columns, summarize the decrease in irrigation water applied by simply building farmers' understanding of how much they need to apply when the soil is saturated, when it's not. In red, we see the percentage changed, the percentage change, which red ranges from about a low of 14% to 20%, so that's pretty significant. I'll just also note that in all locations with the interventions where water use decreased, we also saw an increase in yield of up to 25%. So where do we go next? Well, as the climate crisis deepens and the ecosystem services upon which we depend become increasingly threatened, a transformative planning approach, considering the interdependencies between water, energy, food, and the environment can avoid trade-offs of sectoral thinking and support overall resource efficiency towards sustainable development. Water management is essential for climate adaptation and water accounting is a key tool to support better water management. In data scarce areas, such as in many of the African countries, earth observation data provide an, the only um, alternative. But at the moment, these data are not being fully exploited due to challenges in access and a lack of capacity in their use. Transforming open access data from satellites to universally accessible information is key to informing policy and investment decisions, as well as in empowering a diverse range of communities to take climate action. This is the gap that Digital Earth Africa is addressing. So when next is a really exciting collaboration where we build on Digital Earth Africa to operationalize and scale the water accounts across the African continent. So before I hand over to Cedric, I'd just like to close by thanking the Crawford Fund for recognizing the importance of this work and by doing so, amplifying the message that water management is essential for climate adaptation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa, and uh, uh, thank you for, for opening our eyes to the importance of the work that, that Digital Earth Africa uh, is doing. There really is no other way to, to achieve some of these insights that, that we're garnering other than, than Earth observation data, so thank you for that. Um, so where next on a more immediate note um, is our second speaker. Um, Dr. Cedric Jorand. So Dr. Jorand is a geologist by trade and has over 15 years of experience in the resources sector. At Geoscience Australia, he's played a key role in establishing the Digital Earth Africa program over the last three years. Uh, and on behalf of the Digital Earth Africa establishment team, he will now deliver a distinguished Geoscience Australia lecture, Digital Earth Africa, empowering African-led solutions for climate action with Australian innovation. Please join me in welcoming Cedric to the stage. Thank you, Trent. And uh, welcome and good morning to everyone in the room or online. So, um, over the past three years, um, Geoscience Australia has been uh, privileged to lead the establishment of uh, a novel approach to empower countries to use uh, satellite data. Uh, that would be Digital Africa, or DE Africa in short. Uh, DE Africa aims to improve the life of people in Africa by providing planners, policy makers, decision makers with uh, information from satellites that support better decision making and sustainable development outcomes. The Digital of Africa program is primarily funded by the Australian government, so the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and the VEM slave 
uh, charitable trust uh, with support from uh, AWS. The program, uh, Digital of Africa, draws a lot from the Australian innovation, uh, partly from Geoscience Australia's Digital of program, and uh, I will cover uh, this in, in my talk how the Australian innovation is helping Digital of Africa. So uh, I will start with a, a short video, four minute video. Uh, it's an extract from a creative piece, and this film is using uh, satellite images from the Digital of Africa platform and Digital of Australia platform. Uh, it's produced by media, arti media artist Grayson Cook and composer Dugan McKinnon, and I will come after and uh, I explain to you why I'm showing you this video.
So just as an information, uh, this video is now displayed at uh, the Australian Pavilion of the COP27 um, in uh, Egypt, and this is a picture taken yesterday. Um, so the reason why I've shown you this video is because um, you can really hear and understand that satellite imagery can uh, provide a, a tool and is really a powerful tool to visualize and measure changes. Uh, and this way you can understand the patterns of what is happening at the Earth's surface, what is changing, and then make better decisions. Uh, should it be for climate adaptation and mitigation or other issues? Uh, but that is if you have access to it with necessary time depth to understand the phenomenon you want to, to trace in an open way and uh, with a minimum bias to entry. So that's where uh, Digital of Africa comes into play. Um, so Digital of Africa uh, really is uh, aiming to, to provide uh, of observation data uh, to policymakers, scientists, private sector, civil society uh, to address social and environmental and economic challenges on the continent and also developing uh, an ecosystem for innovation across sector. So that provides information around the agriculture and food security, water resource and flood risk, land degradation, urbanization, or coastal erosion. So the GE Africa program operates according to a number of, uh, of key principles. First, the data from GE Africa is free and open, interoperable, so removing barriers to use and reuse uh, the data. The operational services that cover the entire continent and uh, which can be technically sustained so that people anywhere in Africa have the opportunity to benefit from the DAFRICA services. Accountability and transparency uh, with a government that ensures that DAFRICA delivers to African needs and meet funders' expectations and diversity and inclusions, uh, harnessing the power of diverse community and fostering collaboration. So in effect, what, how the program is uh, achieving that? Um, first, uh, the program is gathering the full collection of free satellite data from the providers, so mainly Landsat and Copernicus data. Process them so they can be readily analyzed um, and uh, easily analyzed, optimized for access through, through the web. Make them freely discoverable, accessible for different interfaces so user can visualize and analyze them. Derive continental services that are co-designed uh, with the users to make sure that they are fit for purpose and indeed be used. Otherwise, you may walk into a very expensive trap. Distribute the services through as many platforms uh, so users can access them as they wish. And build capacity so users know that those products and services exist uh, and can use them uh, for their own needs. Um, so this one is quite often overseen and it's actually critical uh, and uh, um, requires very large amount of efforts. So at the moment, uh, four petabytes of data are available from uh, Cape Town in Africa uh, for satellite data ranging from 10 to 30 meter resolution. And some of them go back to the early 80s. So the aim of Digital of Africa is uh, that countries are empowered to use the, the Earth, uh, Earth observation data for uh, usage for following or tracing changes on the land, water resources, human settlement, uh, to make evidence-based policy decisions. And because they make uh, informed decisions, lives are improved. Development activities are more effective for access to this uh, information, so better understand the root cause of issues and develop impactful solutions. And the digital transformation is advanced for industry uptake and innovation. So it has been estimated that uh, the potential benefits for the African continent is uh, over uh, $2.7 billion. Uh, it's actually now uh, assessed to be uh, over $3 billion. So since 2019, uh, the Digital of Africa team has grown from a global network of expertise, experience, and partnerships. So it is now, uh, it has a governing board that provides a strategic oversight, a technical advisory committee that ensures that the, the program is responsive to uh, African needs. Uh, it has uh, implementing partners in uh, uh, different places in Africa. Um, 
and an extensive, an extensive range of uh, enabling collaboration and partnership through uh, AWS S3, working with uh, FAO, GeoClam, NASA, uh, and others. In 2022, uh, we transitioned the program's operation to the leadership in Africa. So effectively, as the 1st of July, uh, the Africa is uh, Africa-led and owned. The D Africa's global network of users uh, is from governments, university, private sector, entrepreneurs, uh, and uh, every users in between those different uh, type of institutions. Digital of Africa has a strong capacity development program, uh, and uh, uh, through this uh, uh, program, we are expanding uh, our user community. We are proposing an online um, um, capacity development program, and uh, so far we have more than 400 people that completed uh, the training online. We have probably at least twice this number that uh, have uh, attended to face-to-face -face workshops since the end of the pandemic. Uh, we have more than uh, 2,500 2, people that have uh, connected to our analysis softwares and uh, over 13,000 that have used our visualization platform. And uh, through the capacity development and user engagement efforts, uh, we have a diverse range of users uh, and uh, we're starting to see the impact of uh, Digital of Africa through uh, use case studies. So 25 of these use cases have been published uh, and there are a lot more that are, are not published. Um, so that is for uh, a quick presentation of what Digital of Africa program is. Uh, and I will now um, maybe dive into how the Australian innovation is helping Digital of Africa. So as mentioned by Lisa, uh, one of the primary problems of satellite data users are data access, data preparation, and efficient analysis to support user application. And that's where the, the Open Data Cube uh, is the key critical uh, tool that uh, is enabling uh, access to the Earth observation. So it's born from the Australian Geoscience Data Cube uh, and then CC up in the Open Data Cube. And the Open Data Cube is a non-profit open source project that was motivated really uh, to better manage satellite data. So if there is a need, there was a need there to, to develop something that is open. And the Open Data Cube is the open source geospatial data management and analysis software that provide access to the satellite imagery and data processed by Digital of Africa and also by Digital of Australia. So Digital of Australia is providing a code into the Open Data Cube, tutorials, and Digital of Africa is supporting uh, by organizing uh, conferences or hackathon to support the Open Data Cube. So through this Open Data Cube, um, uh, African diplomatic partners can uh, access the data, analyze the data, and uh, collate them uh, so they can work on the different issues that uh, they are facing. And this way, Digital Africa contributes to what Geoscience Australia's mission to provide national and international leadership in geoscientific and open source data. And in terms of uh, Australian innovation, uh, Digital of Africa is distributing data sets that can be visualized through this interface, uh, that is called Daria, uh, and this interface is developed also by uh, uh, CSRO, uh, so an Australian institution. Digital of Africa is providing also an interface where you can do some uh, programmation, so you can do analysis on a data set. Uh, the, uh, the former um, interface was just to visualize and see the differences. This one is to do some uh, deep analysis uh, using coding. Um, and uh, through this interface, uh, Digital of Africa is now providing more than 100 analysis tools uh, that can help to uh, um, support the UN Sustainable Development Goals, uh, should be 
should they be related to the climate or not? Um, and uh, as of last week, uh, we, Digital Africa, received uh, an award uh, at the group of up observation uh, related to, to those analyses to, to support um, sustainable development goals. So part of those tools were coming from Digital of Australia, so Australian innovation, was that were adapted to the African environment and co-developed with uh, users in Africa to make sure they are fit for their needs. And as I mentioned, uh, Digital of Africa is also generating continental scale services um, that can be, for example, uh, cloudless mosaics uh, on the left, cropland text stamp map, or water observation from space, uh, coastline monitoring of fractional cover, um, and three of them, the one with a red frame, are directly coming either from uh, uh, Geoscience Australia or for, with collaboration with uh, uh, Australian universities. So um, now maybe a story about the project that was uh, brainstormed and pioneered in Australia, peer-reviewed and recognized around the world, co-designed and endorsed through engagement with partners and users in West Africa and East Africa, processed in South Africa, validated in Senegal and 12 other countries in Africa, launched in Ghana, and that provides information on climate and anthropogenic impacts around the entire coast of Africa. So, um, in terms of context, um, the coast uh, in Africa um, serve as a major socioeconomic hub for 38 uh, African countries. Um, around the coast, you will find uh, half of the 15 African megacities that are continuing to expand. Um, the African blue economy uh, around the coastal areas uh, is expected to be worth $405 billion and employment more than 57 million people in 2030. The issue is those coastal community and blue economy are vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Rising sea level and rates of coastal erosion represent, represent a pressing threat uh, for the African coastal communities, uh, real estate, agriculture, aquaculture, um, and coastal erosion has a severe impact on the African land, buildings, uh, with an estimated losses of up to 8 billion per year. So coastal erosion has consequences for fish population, mine ecosystem, local communities, and their livelihoods. Sustainable management of coastal changes and mitigation of risks uh, rely on consistent, regularly updated data across the continent. Issue is that this is not existing at the scale of the continent. And uh, because monitoring coastline is challenging, um, it's a dynamic environment, it's changing all the time. Um, monitoring can be expensive, impractical, large scale, if you're going on the field, and it's usually restricted to well study local sites and populated areas. Um, so that's where having freely available satellite image archives can offer a powerful and cost effective tool but for monitoring coastline at regional and national scale. So mid coastlines. So coastlines provide information uh, around the, the coastal changes, so coastal change hotspots. So what is in red are area of erosion, in blue of accretion. If you zoom in, you have information around the detailed rate of coastal changes. And if you zoom even further, you can see the annual shorelines uh, from 2000 to 2021. So the way this project or service has been developed is, first it has been developed in Australia, and then we uh, discuss with our partners uh, in Africa about the, uh, the fact that we could develop that for Africa, but is it something that one is needed? Uh, so we went through consultation with our partners that uh, organized user engagement, discussed with institutions, and decided that yes, this product is definitely something that is needed. 
Um, so we work with our uh, different partners to see what uh, could be changed or what is needed in terms of changes around what is existing in Australia and uh, uh, develop uh, those changes. The product, once uh, processed in uh, South Africa, uh, was then validated uh, in West Africa uh, through our partners in Senegal. And uh, two weeks ago, uh, we launched it in, in Ghana during the Geo Blue Planet conference. But better than me talking about it, maybe we can listen for the people that work on the project. So yet another video. Coasts are an important part of the land on which we live. In order to protect these special areas, we must understand how they are being impacted by weather, the changing climate, and the expanding human population. Coastlines are fragile. They ebb and flow with each weather event. They are the first line of defense in a storm. They are the first to experience the rising sea levels. With a rapidly changing climate and growing populations, we must protect the fragile and vital ecosystems of the coastlines in Africa. Now, we have the tools to help us understand and protect our coast. Introducing Coastlines, a new service from Digital Earth Africa. Luti Digital Earth Africa has uh, been developed by Geosciences Australia en rapport avec le centre sociologique. C'est un outil qui permet de suivre différents indicateurs par rapport au risque côtier, par exemple, dans le domaine qui nous intéresse. Et l'intérêt, c'est que ces images Landsat de moyenne résolution sont facilement accessibles, sont gratuites, alors que les images haute résolution sont chères et pas forcément accessibles. Et nous, dans le cadre du travail que nous voulons faire, donc à l'échelle régionale, à long terme, Bien, il est beaucoup plus avantageux, avantageux de pouvoir accéder à des images gratuites pour pouvoir pratiquer ce suivi des indicateurs à long terme. Through the use of satellite imagery and data, the Coastlines Monitoring Service allows users to map the location of the African coastline and identify patterns of coastal change. On peut d'ores et déjà se projeter sur les perspectives euh, d'usage. Donc la première idée qui vient à l'esprit, c'est d'utiliser l'outil euh, pour, pour le suivi du trait de côte au niveau de trois échelles, l'échelle régionale, l'échelle nationale ou bien l'échelle locale. Donc l'autre idée qui vient à l'esprit, c'est de pouvoir utiliser l'outil Digital Earth Africa euh, Coastline dans le cadre de l'Observatoire Régional du Littoral Ouest Africain pour le suivi de l'indicateur érosion et accrétion. Le Littoral Ouest Africain a quelques particularités, mais globalement, il euh, y a également des des spécificités qui, qui sont partagées avec, euh, par exemple, euh, l'ensemble du littoral euh, au niveau mondial. C'est une zone qui concentre beaucoup de, de personnes. 50% de la population urbaine est localisée au niveau de, du littoral. Il euh, y a l'essentiel des activités économiques également euh, est concentré au niveau de cet espace-là. Et sur le plan de la biodiversité, euh, presque 50% du linéaire est composé de vasières à mangroves. Or, les mangroves, ce sont des zones de haute biodiversité qui regroupent beaucoup d'espèces végétales, halieutiques, etc. Through Digital Earth Africa Coastlines, we can plan for the future by unlocking the patterns of the past. So and now the next step for, for this service is uh, to develop the capacity in the different countries in Africa and we're working with our partners in East and West Africa at the moment um, to do so. So I will finish my talk here and just like to uh, acknowledge our, all our partners and funders. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Cedric. And, uh, um, and I, I uh, really appreciate the, the, uh, the insights you've been able to give us there. Really, um, really uh, important work that, that you've been doing and, and the, uh, the work that you've done to uh, take Australian innovation and, and apply it uh, in uh, another continent really shows the global applicability of the things that we're working on here.